Well, good evening. Welcome to Community and Technology, where we connect the global community with news, information, and resources to hopefully help improve your life. I'm Stu Reed. I'm here with my co-host, Dave Bernstein. Hey, Dave. Hello. And we have a very, very special guest that uh, Dave is going to introduce. Dave? Marty, I like to introduce... I like to introduce people by talking about what they're doing. In your case, we can get to what you're doing, but there's something you once did that changed the world. Tell us about a phone call you made almost 50 years ago. Well, I think you're talking about a call I made in 1973, which is uh, over 40 years ago. That's a, a, a long time. Uh, and that call was on the very first cell phone, the very first handheld cell phone. Of course, today we only have handheld uh, cell phones. Uh, and that call was made to a, a person in the Bell system. This is the old AT&T. And he was running a program where the Bell system was going to be a monopoly for all cellular services. And guess what their solution is to the freedom that people get when they communicate everywhere, their solution was car telephones. Mm -hmm. And we didn't believe that the world needed car telephones. The world was ready for the freedom that you get from being anywhere, not just tied to your desk, to your kitchen, or to your car. And so uh, when I demonstrated that very first telephone call on the streets of New York, in 1973, April 3rd, 1973, I pulled out my address book, which was printed. Nobody has a printed address book. <laughs> and, and looked up uh, Joel Engel's number. I called him and I said, Joel, I'm calling you from a cell phone, but a real cell phone, a personal, handheld, portable cell phone. I think I covered it enough. So uh, there was silence on the line. I think uh, Joel was gritting his teeth. Uh, he was very polite. But to this day, uh, he doesn't dispute that I made that call, but he doesn't remember it. And I, and I guess I don't blame him. And what happened next? Somehow, that I don't think it had 4 billion cell phones uh, planned when you started that. Oh, I wouldn't say that. We, uh, you, you understand that this was really primitive times, right? We, uh, there were, there were uh, no personal computers. Uh, there were no uh, digital cameras. The internet didn't really exist, uh, at least not for pe ordinary people. So uh, these were, so we, we couldn't imagine what a smartphone would look like back in 73, but we knew that someday everybody would have a cell phone. And the way we expressed that was, someday when you were born, you would be assigned a phone number. And if you didn't answer the phone, you would die. So we really knew that, uh, that uh, both of you guys were gonna have cell phones someday. And what, uh, what, uh, company, what company were you with at that time, uh, Marty, when, when you first uh, introduced that phone? I'm sorry, what was I? What, what company were you working with when oh, you developed I, the phone? Oh, I thought we mentioned that. <laughs> this was uh, Motorola. And uh, uh, Motorola, as you know, is, or maybe you don't know, that they are still a world leader in uh, two-way radio communications. It's called Motorola Solutions. So, uh, and that was the division of the company that I was in uh, at, at the time. And so we were already building two-way radios. We already knew that, that companies uh, who needed communications, who had resources that were mobile, had to have communications. It was just necessary. And when we gave them portable communications, it became even more necessary. So we got the message pretty soon of how important it was to have a, a principle of uh, uh, the telephone wire connected one place to another place. Communications is person to person, and the only way to do that is with a uh, portable phone 
uh, like what we uh, created back in 73. Well, you created something in 73 that worked, that, but it took a long way before it got to the market and people's use. You've got a chapter in the book you just did where you talk about how the development wasn't a stroke of genius. It wasn't a eureka moment. Tell us what it was like building a real cell phone that people could use. Well, first of all, the, the dream of, of uh, widespread personal communications started a lot earlier than 1973. And what stimulated putting the phone together, it was that situation of the, uh, what the Bell system wanted to do. But when we were ready to put the phone together, it turns out that there are pieces of this phone. We needed a special antenna. We needed a, a integrated circuit that could search for 400 channels instead of one or two channels. And we needed a way to do duplex communications where people could talk and listen at the same time. And I knew where all of this technology was uh, in our laboratories. Uh, and it turns out, if, if you think about what it took to make this invention, it took the, the genius of a whole bunch of different people uh, and somebody that knew where all this stuff was that could put it together and somebody who was crazy enough to risk their career on, on building a phone like that in three months. And uh, I just had a wonderful team of people and uh, they came through. They had to work. It took 20 people working day and night to produce that first phone uh, in, a, in a little over three months. It, it was a remarkable achievement. But to get from that first phone to one that you could put on the market and sell to thousands and ultimately millions of people, how big a team did you need? Well, I'm sorry, how many what, Dave? How many people did you need? How big a team did you need? To well, make that commercial? the first phone was, was only 20 people. I think you know that the technology to create uh, the kinds of, of uh, phones and services we have today uh, took uh, many thousands or probably tens of thousands of, of engineers and scientists and and. Uh, uh, people with those kinds of strength, distribution people. But you, you mentioned that it take, took 10 years from the time we demonstrated a working phone to the time that a, a consumer could go and buy one. And you might want to ask why, uh, why it took us 10 years. Well, it turns out that phone, this technology we talked about, was really right out of the laboratory. You know, some of the parts had to be very specially made. Uh, the, the phone was put together by uh, skilled engineers. Uh, and even when I demonstrated that phone, we weren't sure it was going to work for very long because it had hundreds of parts all jammed into this fun box. By the way, here's what it looked like. Wow. Wow. So uh, this thing was, was uh, huge by today's standards. Uh, it, but it did. It was a cell phone. It talked on 400 different channels. Uh, it weighed uh, two and a half pounds. The battery life was something like 25 minutes of talking. Uh, 25 minutes was plenty because this thing was so heavy you couldn't hold it up for 25 minutes. So, mm -hmm. so uh, uh, where are we going? Oh, why did it take 10 years? A part of it is that the FCC had to decide, make the decision of whether this was gonna be a monopoly uh, and whether this was gonna be car telephones or personal phones. Uh, that process took oh, at least six or seven years. And then when the FCC was just about getting ready, we realized that we still had a ways to go. So we stalled for a little while, uh, but between those two things, getting the technology ready and getting the regulatory part ready, it was a, a ten-year process. And a lot of us are still working with the FCC, and you wound up reconnecting with the FCC. Tell us about the new head of the FCC, 
Jessica Rosen Wurzel. You did a magazine article with her, I think. Actually, we did a, an op-ed in the, uh, in the uh, San Diego uh, newspaper. Uh, now, I still have a, a good relationship with the FCC. I, uh, I serve on the Technological Advisory Council of the FCC, and these are uh, 50 or so uh, people who I have, have some expertise in the in industry, uh, and we serve on subcommittees that try to solve problems, problems like uh, do we have a way of having people uh, recover lost phones or keep people from using their phones? Uh, we have committees uh, working on 5G uh, and uh, things about the committees on technology. So uh, this is uh, my way of staying uh, hooked up with the industry. I do have some specific areas that I work very hard on. I'm uh, uh, very concerned about what they call the digital divide. And, and that is uh, especially important uh, in education. Uh, I don't know if, if you are aware of the fact that, that uh, as much as 40% of the students in this country do not have access to broadband. The education system is finally evolving. It's changing from the old you know, paradigm of a teacher gets up in front of a class and talks for an hour. And, and you know that that's not the way people learn. People learn in the real world, uh, going out and solving problems. And, and that's the way the education system is moving to having students almost educating themselves because we have made the educational process so interesting and, and so compelling that they, you don't have to force them to be in a classroom. And then when they go to school, they get counseled because every student is different than every other student and people need personal advice. So uh, uh, I believe that having broadband access to everybody is now essential. And 40% of our students don't have access for one reason or another, either they live in a rural area where there's no coverage, or they live somewhere else and they can't afford it. Well, Some other society has got to solve that problem. You cannot have two classes of people, the smart people and the dumb people. So, uh, you know, that is certainly not in a democratic world, you can't do that. We have to figure out a way to uh, get the most advanced education to all of our students. Stu, remember yeah, well, the show we did before Christmas with the lady from the Legal Aid? Mm -hmm. I'm forgetting her name. I but, don't recall her name either, but the, the issue was she that, working on? She was working on uh, getting uh, Wi-Fi into shelters where uh, homeless families uh, that had many kids were struggling with access to education. And uh, it, it's a big problem here in New York City where we are. You know, I do a lot of work with folks in the New York City public housing, which has a population of over a half a million people. And it's estimated that 50% of those families do not have internet access at home. So it's a huge problem. Um, my small group, Digital Divide Partners is our group, we have partnered with local resident groups and associations to build small community networks in various housing developments that provide free access and also do digital literacy and applications that encourage folks to use the technology. One of the folks, one of the things that we found, especially with some of the elderly folks, I say that affectionately, I'm, 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 we're all seniors here, uh, some of the older folks don't really know why they should be using the internet. Or how, how, why is it important to them? What is the relevance? So we've done things like we've created streaming radio stations that help give a voice to folks in some of these communities that don't normally have a way to get out into the public media per se. So, but, but uh, your point is very interesting, Marty. And, and I, I've seen that and I, so I very much agree with you that the old educational model, I, I, I've done some teaching back in my day, it does not work except unless you have an exceptional teacher. The classroom model 
the traditional classroom model is really so antiquated. So I'm, I'm hoping that, 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 that this crisis that we're in now, that the pandemic crisis, is going to move the educational model to a new space and a new place, as you said, where it's more self-initiated and where the students are more taking control of, the, of their education. But as you mentioned, we've got to get over this hurdle of the digital divide because so many folks just don't have access and, and, and access and no digital tools are a requirement. Yeah, we are on the same page, too. Uh, mm -hmm. and the only thing I would add to what you're saying, certainly uh, uh, you have said it much more eloquently than, than I did. The only thing I would add is uh, having Wi-Fi uh, is a step in the right direction, but you, uh, I like to think about the long range. What is the really right way to do this? And there has to be enough capacity at low enough cost so that every student can be hooked up to the internet wherever they are at any time, not just when they're at home and not just when they're in a library. Mm -hmm. The student of the future, when he has a thought and he wants to explore it, he has to be able to do it wherever he is. And it's been demonstrated that people that are challenged like that, that are constantly connected their brain ends up growing faster, uh, and they are, uh, end up being smarter, to put it simply. And uh, uh, you uh, hate to admit that, but our kids are going to end up being smarter than we are. That's not a bad thing. No, that's a good thing. <laughs> but, but having two classes of, of children. That's not good. That's un unacceptable. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, let me just take a quick break. We're uh, here on WHCR 90.3 FM. The Voice of Harlem. I'm Stu Reed and I'm with my co-host Dave Burstein. And we're talking to Martin Cooper, an esteemed uh, American engineer, uh, one of the inventors of the first mobile cell phone uh, back in 1973. Hold on. We don't yes. want to say one of the inventors. This, and Marty will tell you the, the inventor. who works with it. I stand corrected. Um, I, I'm wondering what you guys, whether or not either of you guys saw a recent paper put out by, AT, uh, by uh, Verizon uh, about uh, a proposed approach to solving the digital divide. They are proposing uh, a change in, uh, uh, I guess it's a sidestep from the universal service fund. They are proposing that the government provide a subsidy of 20 to $50 for every low income family for broadband and that the subsidy go directly to the families and the individuals and that they be allowed then to purchase whatever service that they deem uh, uh, effective for them. I wonder if you guys saw that, what do you think of it? Let me point out something there because the Washington Post got it wrong. The proposal from Verizon is that the money go directly to Verizon or T-Mobile or whatever carrier you would. The people never see the money. And one of the problems that they're there is that when Verizon put this out at 20 or $30 and AT&T the same, they're selling a service that they can deliver for somewhere between two and $6. And the whole thing coming out of Verizon is not about connecting everybody. It's about doubling and tripling the $10 that we now pay for universal service per person and getting the rest of the money going straight to their bottom line. I was horrified to see this. Marty, you, is, you, uh, am I right uh, about the marginal cost of adding somebody to an existing uh, cell phone network that it's very low? that if Verizon wanted to add 2 million people, it wasn't going to cost them the $30 that they want to charge, would it? Well, uh, you know, we're on the same page again. You didn't need me on this program, but uh, the, the problem is covering everybody. And nothing Verizon said uh, talks about how they're going to get the rural areas. It's not just a matter of, of uh, subsidizing the cost for those people that already have coverage. Uh, about 20% of the population 
in places where there are just not coverage. And the problem is that they're trying to cover the, the country for education with a system that's it's not designed for that purpose. The, the cellular system, 5G, 4G, the whole system is a very sophisticated system that's designed to, to provide uh, high speeds with high reliability, uh, low latency. You don't need all those features for, for school and every one of those features costs money. So what we, the requirement is to come up with a solution that is basically low cost so that some company or companies can make money delivering that service without cost to the taxpayers. We are having the government uh, uh, give money to Verizon or at and uh, to just keep doing the same things they're doing now does not solve the problem. It doesn't come close to solving the problem. We have to figure out how to get bandwidth to all the students in the country at a, at a low price. And that includes students in rural areas, it, it includes students in the, in the uh, densest areas and, and everything uh, in between. Just in this country, Marty? Or can we say that it can be done around the world? Well, in India, India, what, what, you know what a typical uh, wireless internet connection costs uh, in the U.S. Is, is, is something like $60. In India, you can get internet service for between $5 and $10. This is not subsidized. It's, it is what a, a, a consumer in India can do when they want the wireless internet. Well, there's a disconnect there. And part of that disconnect is that our carriers are building this really sophisticated system. A lot of it is designed for a thing called the internet of things, where you use broadband to control uh, factories, to, to uh, measure things, uh, and that's a very expensive network. And guess who's paying for it? They, they, they're working on the Internet of Things, and they haven't finished the Internet of People. Mm -hmm. And technology doesn't mean a thing unless it's people that uh, are service that people benefit. Sorry, I'm getting on my soapbox. You could tell that I've... I'm going to take you down from that soapbox in a few minutes and talk about the technology, how we do the things you're talking about. Because that's always the question I want, I want to get answered. How do you do it? What should the FCC do next week? Well, February 6th, yeah, at their meeting that's going to talk about how to split, change the coverage in the United States. What should the people do in India and Indonesia and most of Africa, where well, they don't have any wires. So everything has to be wireless. What's the right technology? But before we take the break, which we do at the half hour, let's talk about choices here in the US. Some people think that we have to spend $80 billion, that's the number that people are throwing around, to bring fiber to every home because you can't do the things on the internet wirelessly. Are they being, are they, uh, are they trying to sell fiber? Are they really talking about people's needs? Can you deliver what everybody needs wirelessly? Do we have the capability? Well, a, a very simple answer to that. I think I, I could always tell when somebody asked me a question when they, they know the answer. <laughs> We, uh, we cannot afford to have a fiber to every home with today's technology, and it's not necessary. It turns out that, that uh, with the, the way technology is moving, the capacity of our wireless systems is increasing. It's doubling uh, every two and a half years and has for over 100 years. There is going to be plenty of wireless capacity to take care of most of the needs of society. So uh, the idea that you have to have fiber to every single home, uh, I think is a, a, a wrong priority. And you already heard of what I think the first priorities are. The, the, the uh, first priorities are number one, education, uh, number two, uh, healthcare, 
because uh, in the future, the, your health is going to depend to a large extent uh, on devices that, that are on your body that are connected and are uh, monitoring your body all the time and, and uh, actually connect, collecting information that knows when you're starting to get sick and stops you from getting sick before you really get sick. So there is a potential for wireless technology to eliminate disease. And, and uh, the final thing is the whole idea of collaboration, of people working together, like the three of us are doing uh, at this moment. Uh, with, with three people, you get more than three times the number of, of ideas. People stimulate each other, as, as we are doing now. Uh, and uh, between all of those things, you don't need fiber to the home. What you need is everybody wirelessly uh, connected at some point in the future. Sure, it's going to be nice to have fiber to some homes because uh, some people are going to want uh, three-dimensional holograms uh, in their living room. Well, uh, I think that's very nice, uh, but we got a long way to go before that's practical or necessary. And uh, we, uh, before we... Uh, uh, try to solve the problems of the elite like that. Let's solve some of the basic problems, education, healthcare, collaboration for people, not, not things. I know I'm holding up my arm that doesn't have a watch. You imagine there was a watch on it. What can a watch do today? A smart watch hooked up wirelessly. What can it determine in tests? Well, I, you know, I don't want to get hung up on, uh, on the hardware, Dave. Uh, oh, but it's such impressive hardware. It's going, to ha it's going to be able to do a pulse ox, monitoring your blood oxygen all the time, letting you know if... Well, you keep in mind that the watch by itself can't communicate with anything. When I, uh, I could be uh, in my living room and I leave my phone in some other room, uh, I'll get a phone call on my watch but the watch is not talking to the world. My cell phone is. The watch is only relaying this thing over a few feet to, uh, to, the, uh, to the cell phone. So I think that, uh, that in the future, one of the things that you will carry with you is a device that is your connection to the world. And then you'll have devices over your body. You might have a a uh, telephone stuck in your ear or under your skin that is for voice calls. Uh, you might have a, a, uh, a pair of glasses or someday it'll actually be embedded on your, uh, on your, uh, in your eyes uh, for, uh, that will have you looking, instead of looking at this tiny screen on your cell phone, you're gonna be able to look at a 60 inch or an 80 inch uh, equivalent uh, television set. So, uh, the, the idea is that, number one, you're connected. And the second thing is your connections do things for you. And every person has different needs. Some people who, uh, whose uh, genes uh, say that they're, uh, as an example, uh, subject to uh, a congestive heart failure will have a device on their body that is sensitive to that specific thing and warns them before they're going to have a heart attack that they're gonna have one pop a pill, call a doctor, whatever the solutions. And it, it is those things that don't take huge uh, bandwidth, but they reflect the fact that everybody is different from everybody else. And everybody should not be forced to have the same device. Now, of course, our uh, uh, manufacturers tell us that, well, if you buy our device, you can customize this uh, with apps, right? Sure. All you have to do is pick a, from among two million apps, which are the right ones for you? Oh, is that practical? So somehow your phone has got to be able to figure out what your habits are, what your needs are, and either find an app for you or create one. Your phone ought to be smart enough to, to serve you and to take care of your needs. After Stu gives a station break, I'm going to bring you back with more about 
how to do these things. What technologies work? What should people around the world be looking for in technology? Stu, it's time. Okay. You're listening to WHCR 90.3 FM, The Voice of Harlem. This is Community and Technology. And I'm Stu Reed with Dave Burstein. Very special guest, Martin Cooper, among other things, the inventor of the uh, mobile cell phone and esteemed engineer. And uh, we've been talking about uh, um, technology uh, servicing uh, people, uh, technology servicing education, and uh, just now, uh, technology in the service of healthcare, another really important area. And I think, Dave, you wanted to uh, talk about some practical items. Okay. You say there's going to be enough capacity. Marty and I know what's happening in the labs and what's happening in advanced networks. Why don't we take a minute or five minutes or 25 minutes, which is what we have, to talk about what's coming and what people should look for. What are the smart technology choices? Say we're in Nigeria planning the wireless network. How would you design that, Marty? What technology is the best today and for the next 10 and 20 years? Well, first of all, why, why don't we talk about what the right way to use this radio spectrum that you talk about? I hope your listeners know what the radio spectrum is. It's nothing more than the radio stations that we pass out. Uh, and people will say, you know, there are only a limited number of radio stations. And they're right. When we manage these radio stations, we do the dumbest things you could imagine. We give some entity, I hope you don't take this personally, Stu. <laughs> we give some entity a, a station and we say, this is yours. And you can use it for whatever you want uh, and whatever technology you got. And, and it turns out that for, at least for communications, that's pretty much the dumbest thing you could do. Uh, and because the way you really want to manage the kind of communications that you do with cell phones, where everybody can talk to everybody else and everybody can talk to the internet, what you want to do is to have every conversation use only the amount of radio space that it needs, only for the time that it needs it, with the absolute minimum power. And if you do all of those things, you increase the capacity of the radio spectrum. Uh, Dave, you, you thought in your prelimin preliminary question that you uh, sent to me that you might double the uh, spectrum. Uh, it's more like a million times. Seriously, if, if you look at how the radio spectrum has evolved since the time of Marconi, uh, who uh, uh, first commercialized radio around the turn of the last century, around 1900, we have increased the capacity, the ability of, of, of the radio spectrum to carry information by 10 trillion times. You know, it took 110 years, but I think we, we double that capacity every two and a half years. We've never had a time when somebody came up with a really good idea to improve uh, communication, safety, some use of the radio spectrum, somehow we have managed to find radio spectrum from them. So we have always stayed ahead of the needs and, and there's no reason why we can't can do that. And we know the technologists can, that can keep us do that for at least another 30, 40, 50 years. They include things like smart antennas, they include things like uh, GPS uh, mapping so that you uh, uh, know uh, how much power you can put out because you know everything uh, around you between uh, uh, those kinds of technologies uh, and spectrum sharing, where instead of having one uh, carrier own a piece of the radio spectrum, people should be working together. They should be sharing the spectrum and, and using the minimum amount of spectrum for every transaction, for every communication they do. You do that and we will have enough spectrum to keep us going for another 50 years. 
And by uh, the end of that time, we're going to think of some new technologies that come along that will uh, solve our problems. So there has never been a scarcity of spectrum, never been a scarcity of radio channels, and there never need be in the future. Ah. But, but uh, M M Marty, doesn't that also require some uh, reworking of the whole economic order? Uh, I, I think the scarcity is, is, is manufactured, if you will, by, by powerful economic interests. How do, how, how do we change that? How do, we, how do we break that up so that the, the, the resource truly is shared? There's always a guy like you that brings up practical stuff. <laughs> but, I, you know, I, I, I am only an engineer. All I can think of is what the technical solutions are, and that's what Dave was pushing. Uh, uh, everything that I have proposed to you in the last 40 minutes is going to require a change in the way we do things. Mm -hmm. And that is the hardest part. Yeah. Technology is not the hard part. Relatively speaking, the technology is the easier part. How do you get the teachers union, as an example, to accept the fact that the nature of what a teacher's job is going to be different? Teachers are going to be counselors. They're going to be people that are, are work um, person to person helping other people uh, uh, learn. So uh, the teachers union will be fighting that to the death. The uh, entrenched uh, carriers, they're going to say, what? Me share my spectrum with somebody else? Well, wait a second, fella. It's not your spectrum. We only give you a license to use it for a while. But there's a condition on that license. The condition is you must use this in the public interest and convenience. They sign a piece of paper that says that. And uh, they don't behave like that. They, the uh, carriers act like they own this spectrum. It's theirs, and they can do whatever they want with it. That's simply wrong. They cannot do that. The law says they should be using it for the public. Well, is it, beside being wrong, how much waste is it? How much more could we get with reasonable changes to how we make the rules. We know Wi-Fi is awfully efficient. That's shared. How well does that work? Well, Wi-Fi is, is, uh, is efficient for some purposes. It's actually very inefficient, uh, technically speaking. But uh, the thing about Wi-Fi is that it, uh, it has uh, excellent reuse. You can use uh, Wi-Fi in one house and four houses down, you can use exactly the same frequency. But the bottom line is that Wi-Fi doesn't really give you true mobility. People are naturally mobile. They want to be able to be anywhere. And with Wi-Fi, you, have, you are stuck in a house or in a building or on somebody's Wi-Fi network. And if you move, you got to shift over onto somebody else's Wi-Fi network. So uh, ultimately, uh, you have to look at the application and op optimize for that application. And the thing that I've been working on is what is the optimum way to do cellular telephony? And there's no question it has to be a shared system with, with all of the attributes that I talked about. Namely, you use only what you need uh, and, 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 and the right frequency and the right amount of power, you do that on a continuing basis. It's what they call dynamic. You have to be able to change things continuously. And, and as I said before, when you do that, and we really do know how to do it, uh, uh, it's gonna, uh, uh, there's gonna be enough spectrum to do everything we wanna do, including uh, uh, virtual reality and augmented reality and uh, all of those things. Uh, now, you, I want to circle back for a second, if you don't mind, Martin. You mentioned earlier the Internet of Things. How, how does that, in your mind, play into this whole uh, kind of reworking of the spectrum? Is that necessary for the Internet of Things to work? And, and wh where do you see the Internet of Things evolving to? 
Well, Stu, that's a, uh, as usual, that's a very intelligent uh, question. I don't have all the answers. Uh, I, I'm working on the technology part of it. I'm trying to persuade the FCC uh, that uh, that this is the way they ought to do it, that they just should throw money at things that they have to uh, uh, put pressure on the carriers to use new technology. And I think if you do that one step at a time, it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. And the first step to me would be to tell the existing carriers, you, uh, we've given you a license for a band of spectrum. You have to use that spectrum in a public interest and convenience. And you've got to be able to cover the whole country. And if you can't do that, then we're going to let other people use your spectrum uh, in the rural areas uh, if they can uh, uh, provide the right kind of service to people. So that's just a, an example of a step forward you could take. Mm-hmm. This would not uh, be harmful to the carriers. And in fact, if they are nervous about somebody else using their spectrum, well, go ahead and serve the rural areas, solve that problem. But I think that if you have uh, entrepreneurs looking at this problem of serving the rural areas and you give them uh, access to this radio spectrum and maybe you help them along, you, you give them a, uh, the ability to put a tower up uh, next to a school uh, if that tower is only used for education. You do those kinds of things and somebody can make money delivering uh, educational uh, bandwidth to rural areas. I'm absolutely convinced of that. So if I can convince the FCC that's the case, they can put the arm uh, on the carriers and we can solve this problem without spending 60 or $80 billion that, uh, that they mentioned to us. Mm-hmm. Are, are, what kind of receptivity are you getting from the FCC? Are they listening? Uh, you know, you know how us with us uh, visionaries, we uh, are not going to let those things hold us back. <laughs> I, right, uh, right, right, right. The, uh, at the moment, uh, for reasons, it's exactly the same thing that we faced uh, 40 years ago when we tried to buck uh, the bell system. And the people that we are trying to change uh, have organizations. They, they have lobbyists. So uh, all I can do is try to tell this story to as many people as will listen and hope that, that the, there are, are leaders evolved in the FCC. I think we are gonna have such leaders uh, and that they uh, uh, little by little start implementing some of the things that I'm talking about. Put the arm on the carriers, just do something to, uh, uh, to to uh, follow the law. That's what the law says. It. That's what you got to do, sir. Uh, all the people, the spectrum belongs to the public. It doesn't belong to the carriers. We only license to them. And somehow we got a seg- segment of the public you're not serving shape up. Either you, you start serving them or we'll let somebody else use that spectrum. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I'm not uh, optimistic that I'm going to do an awful lot of my lifetime, but I'm going to keep trying. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know what happened to Dave. I think he dropped off with somebody. And hopefully he'll be back. Um, Probably uh, the, the, because of some of the comments he made, uh, he offended somebody and they shut him <laughs> off. Talk about the establishment, right? Right. <laughs> you know, uh, I've always worried about that when... Uh, when I make uh, comments about the carriers are not doing their their uh, duty, mm. the, at some point they're going to cut off my service and I won't even be able to make a phone call. Well, you, you, you somehow you managed uh, to survive this long, Marty. I think you must, uh, the gods are smiling on you. I have, they have. Yeah. You know, if, if, you, if you're looking for something to fill in, why don't I show people what my book looks yes, like? Yes, tell us about it. This is uh, the book, as you, as you see. Why does it look okay. back? my screen uh we it looks fine on my screen i I think there's something you can click inside of the zoom that reverses it for you in in your settings oh Uh, with oh is that interesting yes it is it's in your video settings uh you can click i think it's mirror image yeah my cord tell us about it well cutting the cord it's the how the uh, the cell phone has transformed humanity 
Mm-hmm. I think we've covered that. I believe that people are different now than they were before the cell phone came. And there are some bad things about the cell phone, but for the most part, it's been good. And, and uh, I think it's going to get better uh, in the future. Mm-hmm. But somehow people uh, have not been aware of how the cell phone started, what the processes were. They're not aware of how the cell phone is being used in countries throughout the world that uh, are more important than what's happening uh, with uh, advanced countries like ours where we have uh, smartphones. The biggest things that are happening elsewhere in the world, and I talk about that in the book, uh, I talk about the, what the future is going to be uh, and uh, what the long range future will be. So uh, I actually covered a number of topics uh, I don't have t- much time in my life left to write any more books, so <laughs> it's all in one book. Uh, but I hope that uh, people find at least parts of it interesting. The one thing that I try to get across in this book uh, is, first of all, I'd like to inspire uh, uh, youngsters uh, that uh, there is the opportunity to do big things in their lives, but it doesn't happen with a eureka moment. It happens by building up your credentials, by learning, 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 uh, and uh, doing smaller things and then bigger things. And at some point you build up the confidence and the skills so you can do enormous things. So don't, don't expect miracles, instant results. It's, it's hard work, uh, but it's also fun work. Learning uh, to me is the most important thing in my life uh, and I'm 92 years old, and I'm still learning new stuff wow. every wow. day. Wow. So, uh, so that's anyway. Uh, you can get my book on uh, Amazon and hopefully in bookstores and places. Okay, that... cutting the cord. Now, now Mark, how, how did you get involved in engineering? What, as a young person, what drove you to uh, Did you have a passion for it early on? Or tell us a little bit about how you got started. Well, Stu, you know, I, I have... Uh, from my earliest remembrance, from, from remembering when I was, was really a little kid, like a, a five years old, I just was interested in how things work. And I just wanted to know how everything worked. And I still have that curiosity. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I was a little kid, I took things apart, sometimes even managed to put them back together again. <laughs> and I still do that. Mm-hmm. You know, in fact, in fact, uh, I don't want to waste your time, but I, uh, last week, I finally, you know, I've been giving a bunch of talks uh, virtually. And the one thing I have observed is that when I uh, look at you on uh, the screen, Stu, uh, mm. uh, your, uh, my eyes uh, uh, do not look like I'm looking at you. They look like I'm looking off to the side. I've, and I've noticed that. So right now, I'm looking at the camera. Now I'm looking at you, there's not much difference because I found a camera that sits here right in front of my screen. Mm-hmm. And I, I finally, so what I did is I went to Best Buy and I bought several cameras and took them apart because I, I believe that you could have a gadget that, that a, a camera could be as tiny as a pea. And I wanna take this little pea and stick it on the screen right where your face is. Right. So when I look at your face, right. I'm looking at <laughs> so what, what I have just demonstrated to you is how an inventor thinks. Yeah, yeah. You, you yeah. Find, find a problem and come up with a solution. The one thing that I have done uh, that uh, might not be in my own interest, by telling you about this, I have destroyed my ability to patent this. <laughs> now, do you, you get tired of doing what you're doing, <laughs> You could go and take my invention and uh, uh, figure out how to commercialize it and sell it. Well, you know, you, you're, I, I guess, a, an inventor, uh, every problem is an inventor's uh, a dream. Uh, it's all about solving problems. And certainly that very issue that you're talking about, I've noticed that very much so as we've been zooming over the last 10, 12 months or so. My camera's a little above my monitor. And if I look at the camera, then I'm not looking at you. And if I'm looking at you, then, you know, I'm not looking at the camera. And yeah. that's, that, that, that's ingenious, Mark. Yeah, if I, when I get this thing right, 
the camera will be like that. And now I'm looking at your face. Mm -hmm. I'm also looking at the camera, right? right. It's, it's right. Natural. That's that's how it should be. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm reasonably close to that now, and if I uh, if I put you on a full screen, I haven't figured out how to do that yet. Mm -hmm. There it is. Okay, right now, right now, uh, I've got this camera right at your face. Does it look okay. like you used to? It does. Yeah. So this is uh, this is the way uh, I'm giving a couple of talks in the next. Mm -hmm week or two that are going to be on video and this is the way I'm going to do it. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to that invention. You got, you got a customer right here for sure. <laughs> yeah, good. So, so a, a, as we wind up, we just got a couple of minutes left. What, what would you kind of like to leave our audience with in terms of where you see technology evolving, where wireless communications are evolving over the next 10, 20 years? I know you talked about the internet of things and, and the healthcare and devices perhaps embedded uh, on our bodies, but, but what's your long-range vision of where we're going? Well, the, the high-level view is that wireless people, first of all, let me start by saying that everybody is different than everybody else. There are no two people in the world that have the same genes. Mm -hmm. uh, so the thought that, uh, that uh, any one device, service, anything that can can satisfy one person will satisfy another uh, is uh, ridiculous. And what that means to me is opportunity. There's an opportunity to solve all the problems of all the people, not just some of the people, not the people that have the money, not the people that live in the cities, uh, but, but there is technology in existence to solve all the problems. And you only have to remember one thing, Technology is the application of science to create products and services that make people's lives better. If you forget, forget about the people part, you don't have technology. You have a curiosity. You have something that's interesting, but it's not technology. Technology has got to solve people's problems, got to serve the people. And that's my closing okay. Well, thank you. Uh, we've been talking with Martin Cooper, esteemed uh, American engineer and inventor. Uh, thank you so much, Marty, for joining us today on Community Technology. My great pleasure, Stu, and it's great to meet you. Okay. Good luck to you. Thank you. I hope to have you back again. Bye-bye. Okay. Stay tuned for more programming on WHCR 90.3, The Voice of Harlem. Thanks for tuning in.